I'm always surprised that they ask me to back after I preach. <laughs> um, this is a great honor to stand here. And there's a scripture which I prayed almost 40 years every day, maybe more than 40 years. And that's that scripture in Ephesians. God of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of glory, give unto me the spirit of wisdom and understanding, revelation, in the knowledge of him. Let the eyes of my heart be enlightened that I might know three things. Number one, the hope of your calling. I believe that's the call to glory. And number two, the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints. God inherits us, we inherit Him, and you're His inheritance, and in you there's a glory, and it's rich, and almost every time I preach, I think about, oh Lord, you let me speak to your inheritance. This is such an honor. It's an honor that brother and sister Copeland would invite me. And it's an honor that you would come to the session. Bless the Lord. And I, I just thank you for this honor, Father. And I ask you to help me one more time. Bless the Lord. Uh, if I titled this this morning, I would title it a long title. The Soon Coming of Jesus and the Elijah Calling. Uh, for our jumping off scripture, we will use Luke 1, 17. And he, John the Baptist, shall go before him, Jesus, in the power, spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. And here's the part I want you to remember. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. The Elijah calling is to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. In 1967, just one, and it was during the great charismatic outpouring, just one week after I told someone that speaking in tongues was of the devil, I was speaking in them. And that's because Mrs. Ali Honeyegger, wife of Doc Honeyegger, took me to a meeting at 1029 North Utica, Brother Hagen's little office. He had just come to Tulsa. He had four employees, brother and sister Hagen, Buddy and Pat Harrison. Buddy told me that if we had, oh, hi, Pat. Brother Hagen's daughter, I love you. You all changed my life. When Buddy sang those songs, I was the director of the junior choir at my first Baptist church. I took them there and taught them to them. It was wonderful. And brother and sister Hagen, Papa and Mama Goodwin taught us mainly hardly dry behind the ears, even though I'd been saved 20 years, and taught us from the word of God the reality of speaking in tongues and the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. I write a lot about that meeting and brother and sister Copeland were there. And, uh, oh, it was new to me, I'm telling you. And if I would have thought that Brother Hagin was a prophet, I'd probably run out the back door. But on fifth or sixth day when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he announced that he's going to have a woman preacher. My church didn't believe in him. I was called to preach, but... Anyway, if she'd told me she was a prophetess, I'd have fainted dead away. And it was Sister Clara Grace, and she got up and preached with an anointing that was the most powerful sermon I've ever heard. Years later, when I worked for Brother Hagen, I went and, and read what she preached. And she said, you want to know why you're here from the north, the south, the east, the west? Because God's raising up his end time army, and you are some of the chiefs of the clan. Now, if you'd looked at us and thought we were the chiefs of the clan... Brother Copeland came there in a, I say, a car tied together by bailing wire almost. <laughs> and he offered to trade it to Buddy Harrison for all Brother Hagin's tapes, and Buddy begged him not to. 
Don't park that here. We believe in faith. I'll, I'll give you the tapes. <laughs> if you'd have thought that was some of the chiefs of the clan of the end time army, you'd have had prayer for God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. And during that time, I, Brother Hagin laid hands on me. My life changed. In 1970, I went to work for him and became the editor of publications. And in 1975, we had our first graduating class of Rama Bible Training Center. He had a luncheon uh, during that first graduating class. And in that luncheon, when he spoke to those first class, he revealed that before his birth, his mother was told in a vision of Jesus what his given name should have been. And he was not named that. But so after he had the luncheon and he had declared what his given name really should have been, he called me and others and he asked us to take up all the tapes. He didn't want it out, what his given name should have been. Uh, for certain reasons because Branham got off, because Dowie got off, and he said, I don't want to get off, and I don't want people to get off. So he made us vow that we would never tell what his given name should be. Now I'm free to. But then I was not while he was still on the earth. And um, he had us to retrieve all the tapes, all the cassettes. And um, so we did. Now, his life, as you know, was marked with open eye visions. I'm going to talk to you today about that. And the first vision that he had was in Rockwall, Texas at a tent meeting. Many of you are familiar with that. Um, on Saturday, September 2nd, 1950, he had gone for a tent meeting and it was out in the, he talks about it, he takes him a long time to tell it, in the black lands of Texas. They'll, if you stick with them when they're dry, they'll stick with you when they're wet. And they had a big rain and nobody came to the meeting, just a few people and they were in a tent. And uh, during that tent uh, meeting, here's a book called I Believe in Visions. I didn't do this book. I became his editor of publications, but this was done by Fleming Revell. And he went into a room and he told his visions uh, to a tape recorder. And it was my privilege to hear him in that room from outside the door. And it was my privilege to uh, hear those tapes, those original tapes. They were lost for a while, but I think now they've retrieved them. And he just sat in that room, he would cry, he would, uh, it was just marvelous to hear those tapes as he went over the visions that he was given of God. Now, um, hallelujah, he, he was, um, bless the Lord. I'm going to read you some from this book when he was in that tent meeting in Rockwall, Texas. He went that night, the rains came, the crowd was small. I gave a Bible lesson and then invited the people to come to the front to pray. Everyone was praying around the front and I knelt on the platform beside a folding chair near the pulpit. I began to pray in other tongues and I heard a voice say, come up hither, come up hither to the throne of God. And so he did. And, um, uh, Jesus was standing there. I stood in his presence. He was holding a crown in his hands. He told me this is a soul winner's crown. And then he took me up to a beautiful city. We did not actually go into the city, but we beheld it at a close range as one might go up on a mountain and look down on a city into the valley. And uh, Jesus showed him many things. Then Jesus turned to me and said, now let's go down to hell. So Jesus took him there warned men and women about this place. 
Then the scene changed and an angelic messenger came riding across a great wind blown plain. And as the wind was blowing on me, I fell flat on my face on the platform. I lay under the power of God. It seemed as if I were standing high on a plane. I looked to the west. I saw what appeared to be a tiny dot on the horizon. It was a moving thing. It approached him uh, and a scroll was handed to him. Take and read in the name of Jesus. And so he read that scroll for 30 minutes. I'm not going to tell you and read all about what was on that scroll. Uh, but he talked about the move of the spirit and he talked about people being deceived. I'm gathering my own together. I am preparing them for the time is short. Several other exhortations were given to watchfulness. And uh, he said that America is receiving her last warning and call to repentance and the time that is left is comparable to the last seven days of Noah's time. Warn this generation as Noah did his generation. I am preparing my people for my coming. Judgment is coming, but I will call my people away, even unto myself, before the worst shall come. Now, I believe that. I believe Brother Hagin is a true prophet and that that is true. Uh, I heard many more things were said. I heard a voice say, come up hither, come up to the throne of God. I saw Jesus standing about where the top of the tent should be. And I went up to him through the air. He explained the creatures around the throne and all the beautiful things that he saw there. Uh, he told me things concerning my ministry. He went on to say that he had called me before I was born. He said that although Satan had tried to destroy my life many times, his angels had watched over me and had cared for me. Jesus told me that even as he had appeared to my mother before I was born and told her, fear not, the child will be born, I would minister in the power of the Spirit and would fulfill the ministry he has called me to. Um, he gave, he was, well, I'll read you that part. Now I'm going to go about when his mother. Jesus told me in the first vision, I called you before you were born. I separated you from your mother's womb. A week after this first vision, my mother visited me and I related the vision to her. I told her that the Lord had said to me, I called you before you were born. I separated you from your mother's womb. Satan tried to destroy your life before you were born and has tried many times since. But my angels have watched over you and have cared for you until this present hour. I appeared to your mother before you were born and told her not to fear. The child would be born and would bear witness concerning my second coming. When mama heard this, she almost jumped out of her chair. During the months before I was born, she had experienced many difficulties. My father was away. She had humbled herself and gone back to her parents. And she was walking, she was sick, and she was walking from her house to her parents' house. I started down the street, and when I got as far as the front of Aunt Mary's house, I heard a sound like a wind blowing through the trees. I could hear trees stirring, leaves stirring, but there wasn't a single tree anywhere nearby. I became frightened and I looked up to the sky. It was a bright sunny August day, not a cloud dotted the pure blue sky. I walked on a few steps and heard the sound again like wind blowing through trees. I looked up again and this time I saw one white cloud. At first it seemed to be hanging in the sky then it began to descend, and as it did, a form took place shape upon it. Jesus came right down out of the sky and stood before me. Jesus said, Fear not, the child shall be born, for he shall bear witness concerning my second coming. Uh, he was telling me that, uh, that my child would take part in the revival that would usher in the coming of the Son of Man. He would not be the only one, of course, but he would be a part of the last great move of the Spirit. 
I became so frightened that I began to run, his mother said, and I ran the rest of the way to my mother's house. When I arrived there, pale and out of breath, my mother asked, what is it? You look like you've seen a ghost. I immediately told her what I had just witnessed, but I never told anyone else. And she would never talk about it either. We just weren't used to such things. As I listened to my mother tell of her experience before I was born, it fit right in with what the Lord had shown me in this vision. Brother Hagen, at the instruction of the Lord, started Rama Bible Training Center in 1974. I was there. Um, he had a, um, a dinner, a luncheon, for that first graduating class of 56 students. And um, he told that class this, which I don't believe that I'm going to be chasing for it now. If Brother were, Haven were alive, I would be. Because he told us to confiscate all the tapes because he had told this. Maybe you remember this in addressing that first graduating class. Jesus told Brother Hagen in the vision, I told your mother to name you John because you were going to have the part in the second coming of the Lord that John the Baptist had in the first. The call and anointing of Elijah to prepare a people for the coming of the Lord. He told Brother Hagen, even though she did not name you John, the calling is still there. Now, Brother Hagen didn't want people to get off. So immediately he contacted me and others who had the tapes of that luncheon that he'd had with the Rama Grads, first class, 56, gather them all up. And he made us to swear, not swear, but promise uh, that we wouldn't tell what he had told that he should have been named John. He told us privately that he didn't want people to get off as they had with John Alexander Dowie and William Branham. Uh, the people, however, he said, it's not just me. He said, the people who come up under me are a company and they have the calling of Elijah on them to prepare a people for the coming of the Lord. Hallelujah. Kenneth Copeland, of course. You were in that meeting. We sure didn't look like Sister Clara Grace came in and she prophesied. You know why you're here from the north, the south, the east, and the west? This was the, filling, the, the meeting I was filled with the Spirit in 1967. Because Jesus is coming soon and he's raising up his end time army. And you are some of the chiefs of the clan. There's that Brother Copeland over there, Sister Copeland. I didn't know them. They'd come there in a car, I laughingly say, tied together with bailing wire, which you offered to trade with Buddy Harrison for all Brother Higgins tapes. He said, no, take your car and go. I'll give you the tapes, but we don't want anybody to see that car sitting out here. <laughs> Let's look at a couple of scriptures. Malachi 4, 5, the Old Testament ends with this. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. This is the, I'm reading the English standard. Now we're going to go to Matthew 11. This is the Lord talking to his followers. Truly I say it to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is coming, is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he, John, is Elijah who is to come. I'd like you to show the Philip Halverson video, please. And she sustains me, she understands me, 
she knows all these different areas when I begin to move in the middle. Souls, the souls, it's the souls. You see, we got that souls for his kingdom. In intercessory prayer, there is the, all the ministry gifts of the church, but there's areas where you'll never reach. The intercessor in the realm of the spirit, obey, obey, for we obey the spirit, Lord. You go out into those areas where no one goes. You go out where there's a soul lost in darkness. They have reaped the wages of sin. They're hopeless. There's no hope. But in the realm of the spirit, you go out there and you just snatch them out of Satan's hand. Ah, so it is so. Hey, hey, yes, it is so. Sustenance, the sustenance, Lord. Loose that for them, God. Astounding, astounding. Yes, ministries. There are so many of these ministries, but they've got to come forth now. They've got to come forth. Oh, you're going to pour out of your spirit upon all flesh. All flesh, yes. And they're going to come forth. They're going to come forth, Father. And Bobo Dikistasta, obey. For you must obey the spirit. You must obey the spirit. Michael, Michael, in the east, Lord. Yes, for that ministry must come forth out there in the east, all the souls. Free, free, I'm free. Praise God, I'm free. Loose, and I'm loose by thy spirit to move in that dimension, Father, where you move. Youth, youth, I lift up the youth. I lift up the youth. Yay! Yay, Lord! Yay, Lord! Loose them! Use them! Loose them and then use them! Loose them and then use them! Ha ha! Yes! Yes! That's it! Ha ha! That, that, that's a key! It's a key! You loose the youth and then you use it in God's kingdom! This is what God's been saying. You loose the youth. You loose them out of the kingdom of the darkness. Bring them together. Fill them with the Holy Spirit. And use them. Use them. Use them. For His glory. For His glory. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 Y
you know, it's fire here, but the wind carries it, jumps here and here, and it springs up all over, and there's no way you can control it. No way to control it. No way to control it. God's going to do it. Uh -huh. But this meeting that's been called here, and obey, obey. You've got to obey the Spirit. You use a spoon that up. And we've got to learn to move in the ministry that God gives each one of us. Okay, thank you. Bless the Lord. That was at a ministry, that was at a meeting we had in 1983. Bless the Lord, brother. I wanted you to see Brother Halverson. He was very close to Brother Hagen. And all of us, there were so many people that just moved in a realm. And Brother Halverson prayed on a realm higher than any person that I had ever known. Um, I want to talk to you about the Elijah anointing and preparing a people for the coming of the Lord and uh, how that was on Brother Hagen and how that he was supposed to have been called John, like John the Baptist. Now the Lord told him when he caught Brother Hagen up to heaven, it doesn't matter that your mother didn't name you John, the anointing is still there. So uh, I wanted to tell you about a meeting that we had, uh, oh, I don't know what year this was. It was in Painesville, Minnesota. And we, uh, Jim and Kathy, well, actually Kathy Caseman headed up that meeting at a camp, an old camp that had been there way back in the days of Charles Price and way back in Amy McPherson, all those people had been at that camp. So we had a camp there and Brother Halverson was one of the speakers. I was one of the speakers. This is Brother Halverson. We were driving back to uh, Minneapolis, which was 150 miles, I think. While we're in the car, Fern Halverson, you saw her at the first, she says, ask her, ask her, ask her about it. And uh, he, he didn't. And then she said, Brother Halverson's driving. And she said, ask her. She said, and he told me that for years, you saw why he prayed. He prayed totally in the spirit. I don't know of a person who prayed on the level he prayed. And you saw how he jumped? And uh, so he said, she said, and he told me, of all the prayers that Brother Hagen, that Brother Halverson prays, there is a prayer he prays with the heaviest anointing of any, and it's about John. He prays, John, John. If you've ever been in a meeting with Brother Halverson and you've had his hands crush yours with the power of God on him, but the power, she said, anytime he starts praying that, I have to get him out. I have to get him out so the people won't see him because he goes into such a jerking and such a place of prayer with God when he prays John. And she said, it has to do with Brother Hagen because when he prays it, he prays, um, Hagen sell John. Hagen sell John. And she said, before he says that, I don't want him to be embarrassed, so I get him out of there. We don't know what this means. Do you know what this means? And so, even though Brother Hagen made us promise, <laughs> when he addressed that first Rhema graduating class at the luncheon, he made us promise we would not ever tell that he's supposed to have been named John. He didn't want people to go out after him like they did Alexander Dowie and like they did Branham and try to make something big out of him. He said, it's the call on all the people I teach. It's the call on all the people I reach. It's the call on Kenneth Copeland. It's the call on you, Keith. It's the call on me. It's the call on all of you. It is the Elijah anointing, and it is to prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Some say that he isn't. That the church is going to become glorious. I believe that. And take everything over. But we're not taking everything over. Evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. Uh, perilous times will come. Uh, this is from 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. 
For as by man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end. Telos. T-E-L-O-S. This is the end of the age. When he, Christ, delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. Jesus is going to do this. Not us without him. We're not going to take over everything. Sounds good, but we're not. It is good what Brother uh, Oral Roberts talked. Take the Holy Spirit. Take these things into every man's world, the business world, this and that. But we're not taking them all over. And it's not going to be another thousand years till he comes. He's coming very soon. I'm a prophecy teacher. Oh, dear me. You've got all the people of Ezekiel 38 la at, uh, up over there. And we have heard from some uh, all in that region. Right now, Russia is uh, with massive troops on the Ukrainian border, threatening to move on into the Middle East. And all of the uh, players in Ezekiel 38 and 39 are there. I happen to believe there are three wars upcoming soon. I believe one's going on, that's Psalm 93. It's a war that, of attrition between, they call it the Arab-Israeli war, it's really the Islamic God, the Father, Allah, God, the Jehovah war. That's Psalm 83. But then it is in Ezekiel 38 and 39, a coming down into the land of Israel with Russia at the helm and Persia, Iran as the first ally. We've been hearing all the uh, threats that Iran has make, made, but I, I really thought, well, that's very clear that it's going to be uh, Russia. And now we do see some things happening along that line. Now, I am one who believes there will be a war at the end of the seven-year period we call the Tribulation. We have, been at the, we have been with the Father at the married supper of the Lamb. But here on earth, there's been a Tribulation like never seen before. Jesus comes on his white horse, where behind him he puts into the pit uh, of hell, he puts in there uh, the Antichrist, and he puts the prophet, the false prophet. But Satan himself goes in a pit where he's going to be saved, he's going to be let loose in another thousand years, and there's going to be another war at the end of that thousand year millennium. So there's one at the start, one at the end. I am one who believes. I was recently at a church in, uh, oh, where I was I? Uh, uh, but anyway, the pastor didn't believe that Ezekiel 38 and 39 would happen before that it was its own separate thing. But I think it could happen any day. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised it happens this week. We have some information. Um, you can do that with that, whatever you want to do with it. But there are things just popping everywhere. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. We've made for this time. Hallelujah. When his disciples ask when, uh, Matthew 24, 3, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us when will these things be? When will be the destruction of the temple? Second question, what will be the sign of your coming, your parousia? Third question, and the sign of the end of the age. Now parousia, and I hate to say this with my dear, wonderful, beloved friend, I love you so much. Brother Rick Renner, he watches our program on television, Victory Channel, so he can get a good laugh. He told Shelly that. He said, my favorite part is when you, your mother tells you to read something and, and you say, I have no idea where you are, mother. He said, please don't take that out. <laughs> but um, in the Bullinger Bible, it says parousia, which is 24 times mentioned in the New Testament, from the papyri, Egyptian papyri, papers found there, from the Ptolemaic period down to the second century AD, the word is traced in the east as a technical expression for the arrival or the visit of a king or an emperor. Well, what, they were asking him, when are you going to set up the kingdom on the earth? They're Jews. They know he's been talking about the Bible, talking about an earthly kingdom, and there will be one. But then he asked three questions about the end of the age. So here's the sign. Luke 21, 29, the sign. And he spoke to them a parable, behold the fig tree. That's Israel. And all the trees. Those are other nations. Israel's a nation. Those are the nations of the prophecies of the Old Testament. 
They don't have any other Bible except the Old Testament. Behold the fig tree and all the trees, when they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is nigh at hand. We could preach a long time on that, but won't. So likewise ye, when you see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. I could preach a long time on that and say that we are that generation, but I'll just skip right over. I'm the generation that saw Israel come home. 1967, they got back Jerusalem. I've seen it. I believe I'm that generation that's going to see the whole thing fulfilled. Woo! I believe it'll, I'll be in on it. If I'm not, there'll be somebody there <laughs> from my generation. The fig tree is the nation of Israel. The other trees are the trees of prophecy, the trees of the Old Testament, which are Russia, Syria, Iran, all of the ones that are ahead of the news right now. So, um, bless the Lord, I show quickly that chart. My time's slipping away from me, as Brother Hagin said. This is a little chart I made up myself about God's dealings with Israel. He chose them, he blessed them, he's bringing them into the land, then he scattered them, but then there will be a great gathering. And that great end gathering is a sign of his soon return. Oh my goodness, have you been to Israel? Have you seen the buildings? Have you seen the cranes? Have you seen all those things that are witness that Jesus is coming soon? The restoration and the redemption of Israel as a nation. Hallelujah. The Bible is an Eastern book. We often try to understand it with Western minds. Uh, it helped me to get Eastern eyes when I was called by the Lord after my husband moved to heaven in 1986, Lord, what do you want me to do? I want you to go and study Hebrew in the land. And so that started so many things for me. That was 1986. 1988, uh, I had come up to uh, preach at Mac and Lynn's church and Brother Hagen was having a meeting, a camp meeting over in Wisconsin. And people were gonna drive in their RVs and things like that and they were gonna stay in little cabins. So I drove over with Mac and Lynn we got there just a little late after one of the meetings, and I walked in the back down the aisle, and Brother Hagin says, there's Billy Brim. The Lord showed me that she's gonna come up tonight and tell you what the Lord's been showing her. <laughs> you talk about a bunch of disappointed people. They do not know who Billy Brim is from Adam's off ox. I mean, a few more people know me now, but nobody knew me then. I'd been going to Israel for a couple of years, but this is what the Lord, suddenly I thought, oh, this is what he'd been telling me, teaching me. And it was the book of 2 Peter. The whole book of 2 Peter is a whole, it's a letter, it's a whole, and it is to be, it's prophetic. The setting is Peter's departure is at hand. Uh, from the uh, New American Standard 1995, 2 Peter 1.13, I consider it right as long as I, this is Peter talking, he's writing the letter. I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, and the Greek word there is exodus, you will be able to call these things to mind. The New Testament letters never speak of the death of a saint. We don't taste death. We depart. Our tabernacle, we change our clothes. Sister, oh, one of my dear friends who's been to heaven, Dean Braxton, you should Google him. He, he went to heaven, wonderful man of God. And he said, your body doesn't die and then your spirit leave. He said, the body dies because the spirit leaves. Yes. Remember when you saw Gloria's brother? That's the first time I got that revelation. So we make our departure. Um, Alexander McLaren, great man of God, uh, born in Glasgow, uh, 1826. Um, he lived more than almost any 
of the great preachers of his time between his study, his pulpit, and his pen. Sister Jeannie Wilkerson turned me on to the writings of Alexander McLaren. And I was once visiting a pastor up in the Northeast, looking over his library, and there was a book there of a year's sermons by Alexander McLaren. I asked him if I could borrow it. I kept it for years. He, he died and I got under conviction. And I sent it back to his wife. But in that year's worth of sermons, and he had several years worth of sermons books, there was, um, there was a, um, a sermon, a funeral sermon. And one of the great saints of God had gone home and he talked about abundant entrance. Now, I had heard that from Brother Halverson. You heard how Brother Halverson prayed? So I, be, I could hardly pray with Brother Halverson because I wanted to listen to what he's saying. And he'd go in tongues and power would come and then English would come. And so he'd be praying and he'd go, abundant entrance, abundant entrance, arrangements, arrangements. And that would happen from time to time when we prayed. So I said, Brother Halverson, what is that? And he said, oh, some great saint of God's going home. A saint who's earned an abundant entrance. Not just everybody gets, but anyway, we won't go there. <clears throat> There's difference in resurrection. Some people, Brother Hagin said, make it, you know, by the skin of their pants off the altar bench, but anyway. <laughs> but they're there, praise God. So uh, he pointed out in this sermon from 2 Peter, that the same verb is used in verse 5 and verse 11. Now the King James, I think it says, I have it here. The King James says in verse 5, having all diligence add to your faith such and such. And then at verse 11 it says, so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly. Abundant entrance. But that's the same verb. And um, this is in the New American Standard, 2 Peter 1, 5. Now for this very reason also applying all diligence in your face supply. And it names all these things. Then 2 Peter 1, 11, in this way the entrance into the eternal kingdom of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied. They're the same verb. So if you supply and add to your faith, your saving faith, these virtues there will be added to you an abundant entrance. So uh, that drew my attention because I'd heard Brother Halverson pray it. Now another thing to realize about 2 Peter is it's a letter and it's a second letter. It's a letter to the first people that he wrote to. 2 Peter 3, 1, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance and so on. He speaks of promises. Now, uh, Alexander McLaren wrote in his expose on this, since Peter is writing the letter, let's let him define the promises. Second Peter 1, 4, at the beginning of the letter, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Now, Second Peter 3, 3, Let's see what those specific promises are. Of course, every promise in the book is ours. You add these things to you, that's promise. But Peter was talking about some special promises. And here's what they were, 2 Peter 3, 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? He's talking to some people, we're gonna see they were Jews, they were thinking Jesus was going to come any day and Peter was their main man. Not Paul. They liked Paul all right, but he was especially to the Gentiles. But Peter had walked with Jesus and he's about to go. Here's the setting. And he said, 2 Peter 3, 3, here are the promises. He, at the first of the letter, he tells them that he's going to talk about the promises. At the end of the letter, he tells them what the promises are. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days, the end of days, scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but as long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, 13, therefore we... <coughs> 
according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. They were expecting Peter to come back at any time. Jesus to come back, excuse me. They were expecting Jesus' return at any time. I mean, they went, the people that were out there and that watched him go up, it says this same Jesus shall come back. They've been looking for him. But Peter is leaving. He's their main man. And Jesus had not come. He calls them to consider the prophets. 2 Peter 1, 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus. But were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And he's going to tell about being an eyewitness at the transfiguration. For he received from God the Father, <coughs> excuse me, honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Then he goes on to say, but we have a more sure word of prophecy. The propheticos, the word of God, the prophets, the Bible. And the only Bible they had was what we call the Old Testament. And he's calling them to what the prophets said. We have a more sure word of prophecy wherein you do well that you take heed unto a light shining in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise. I believe the period should go there. In your hearts knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture, I was told that by a man who translated it in Finnish Bible. He said, he's already risen in our hearts. So he put in his translation of the Bible, he was so honored, that man, he put the period you should take heed unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the day star arises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no propheticos of the scripture, a prophecy of the scripture, Old Testament prophets, is of any private interpretation. For the prophet came not, prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That's chapter one. Chapter two there were false prophets also among the people and there shall be false teachers among you. He's telling those people, I'm leaving. You look at the prophets. There was a time that false prophecies came. You're going to have time for false prophecies to come. In other words, he's not coming the next day. There's going to be all of chapter two is telling them there's going to be some time before Jesus comes. And then in chapter 3, he's going to tell them when Jesus is coming. Now he has told them, uh, and he is writing this second letter, uh, 2 Peter 3, 1. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your minds by way of remembrance. I want you to remember some things. I want you to be mindful of number one, the words that were spoken by the holy prophets. And number two, of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. I want you to remember what the prophet said. I'm leaving. There's going to be some time. You keep in your mind what the prophets said. And you keep in your mind what Jesus said and we apostles said concerning these promises. Now, this is the second letter. The first letter, let's see who it was written to. This is in the English Standard Version. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion, and in the Greek, that's a diaspora, or diaspora, in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. He is writing to the Jews who had become Christians. They are called the diaspora. Spore is a seed word. It, they've been sown throughout the world. But they're the believers who have come with a background of Judaism. Paul said in Galatians 2, 7, and this is the English standard, on the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, 
Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised. For he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. So this letter is a second letter to the same people and he's going to write to people who came out of Judaism things he would not write to people who came out of idolatry. He's going to call them to remember what the prophets said. The people who came out of idolatry don't even know about the prophets yet until somebody teaches them. Remember what the prophets said and be mindful of what the Lord and his apostles said. 2 Peter 3, 1, in the English Standard, this is the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Now he's told them, I'm writing you this letter. I'm going to leave. There's going to be some time. Jesus is not coming back tomorrow but here's what you pay attention to. You pay attention to those prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zechariah. You cannot really understand these days, folks, unless you understand Ezekiel and what he said would happen. You're going to have to go to those Old Testament prophets because we're told to do it. Now he said, while you're doing this, hallelujah, there's an important thing you've got to remember. Most importantly, you have to remember when considering the Lord's return, above all else, I want you to remember that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. Now, what I'm doing right now is saying to you what Brother Hagin had me come up and say that night to those Wisconsin people who were disappointed. But this is what God had been saying to me. 2 Peter 3, 8, King James Version. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. New American Standard 1995. But do not let this one fact escape your notice. Beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. These believers from the diaspora knew exactly what Peter was writing about. They knew exactly to which prophet he referred. It would be like us receiving a letter from Kenneth Hagin, which encouraged us that we would have what we say. We would all know Mark 11, 23, 24. Nobody had to tell us. Nobody had to tell them. He said, now when you're deciphering it, I'm going to tell you when Jesus is coming, but I want you to remember while you're considering it, one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. Hallelujah. They knew. They knew which prophet he talked about. They knew which prophet talked about the days. The prophet the Jews considered most telling of the Lord's forgiving Israel and bringing the harlot nation back to himself is the prophet Hosea. If you'll turn with me to Hosea chapter 5. Oh, I know Jesus is coming. I know it in my knower. I know it in my gizzard. And I know it from the word of God. And we, you're all under Kenneth e. Hagin. Brother Copeland came in under him. I did. We all did. And we have got the calling of Elijah. And we have the calling to prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. Yes. Preachers don't just skip it. And if you don't know enough about it, call in somebody who does. There are some people that are dearly beloved and love the Lord, but I cannot agree them on these things. I've heard them say such things as forget about the rapture. Oh no. Now, have you found Hosea? Hosea chapter five, verse 14. I will be unto Ephraim, 
that's the northern kingdom, as a lion, and as a young lion to the house of Judah. That's the, that's the um, southern kingdom. Now, he's going to be like an adult lion to the northern kingdom. He's going to tear them in such pieces you could hardly find them. But the southern kingdom, he's going to be like a young lion. I, even I, will tear and go away. I will take away, I will carry them off. And none shall rescue him. He's talking about Israel, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. I will, go and re now you, I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. Now just go right on. Man divided this in chapters and verses. Go right on. Here's what they're going to say when they're seeking God. The northern kingdom and the southern kingdom when they're coming back. Come and let us return to the Lord. For he hath torn us. And he will heal us. He has smitten. And he will bind us up. When is he going to do this? After two days. Will he revive us? In the third day, he will raise us up. What did Peter say? When you're remembering... I call to your remembrance, don't forget, one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. After 2,000 years, on the third day, he will raise us up. Hosea 6, 3. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the former and latter rain unto the earth. Uh, hallelujah. Show the chart of days, please. This chart of days is according to uh, ancient Israel. ancient. Uh, so we have the first two days. And we have... The days of chaos, they're called. Then we have the second two days, the days of Torah, the, the law came. Then the Messiah came. And then we enter into day five and six, which are the latter days. When Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, it was the first of those latter days. Now we are at the end of this seven year period, of, of the thousand year period. Now I got to get a new map here because I think the tribulation is over on the sixth day. I got to get that moved in all of my charts. But we are at the end of that two days that Peter talked about. Two days and then the Lord is coming and all the prophecies that come. After I had uh, preached uh, this at Brother Hagen, where he was preaching, uh, we drove over and I heard this at, I told you with Mac and Lynn, we went over to, I think it was Painesville, I can't remember where, and we heard him teaching. He said, here's Billy Brim and the Lord showed me she's gonna preach tonight. And this is what I preached just right here, the two days. That after two days, Jesus is coming after 2,000 years that he's coming and that he's going to raise us up in his sight. So Brother Hagin said, at the end of that, with all those people, disappointed because Brother Hagin didn't preach. And I preached about the two days and preached just what I told you right now, but got to develop it more because I'm on a time limit here. Brother Hagin said, see me when you come back to the office. Is that good or is that bad? <laughs> you been there? <laughs> so he calls me to the office. I think Shelly was with me. He's got this big desk. And uh, he rises up on that big desk with fire in his eyes. And he says, Jesus is coming soon. And you are anointed to teach these things. I am not. I teach something else. You are anointed to teach these things, and I want you to teach it at camp meeting. I'm going to give you two afternoons to preach it. So I had two afternoons to develop it better than I have here. About the two days and the end of the time, Jesus is coming. And Brother Hagin, when he, when he finished talking to me, 
He rose up on that desk. He got fire in his eyes. It scared me. Jesus is coming soon and Satan is going to do everything in his power to stop it. Things are going on today. It's Satan. It's God. And we're at the end of the two days. And Jesus is coming soon and it's not another thousand years. He said, I'm going to give you two afternoons at camp meeting, 1988, to preach this. And he did. Now, I am going to just throw in something. I have 19 seconds left. 17, 16. God. Jesus is coming. The clock's wrong, he said. Oh, praise God for a broken clock. Uh, there are things right now, some things, uh, information we're even privy to. Um, there could be a war break out. Russia has made a big move and uh, some things could pop. I am one who believes that uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39 is, could be all by itself a great war in which God reveals himself. Not the one that's at the end. Now that's not the one that's at the end of the thousand years. No, I believe uh, at the end of the tribulation, what we call the tribulation period or the thousand years, I think there's another separate thing in which God's going to reveal himself. And uh, the, the, the world is just shaking up right now with these people and the activities of the things that are happening right now. But where do I want to go next? A thousand different ways. One of them, I want to talk to you about the rapture, the catching away of the saints of the church. I believe in it. And um, the scriptures that we particularly believe are 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18. This is King James. I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are falling asleep, that you sorrow not, even as those which have no hope. You see, they were looking for Jesus to come back in any day. Those angels went up and they watched him and he'll come back. And then people start to die. All kinds of things start to happen. And uh, the first letters that were written were the letters to the Thessalonians. The first of all, the New Testament letters. And it was written because God wanted them to know it's going to be a little bit here. Not going to just come like tomorrow. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, falling asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others. For if we believe Jesus died and rose again, even to so them which sleep will God bring with him. Verse 15, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are falling asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, woo, a shout of command with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. That is very comforting. Very comforting. Now that word caught up is the Greek word H-A-R-P-A-Z-O. Harpazo? Is that good enough, Brother Rick? Harpazo. We're going to look where that word is used again. Acts 8, 39. And when they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord harpazoed Philip. Caught away. Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotos, and passing through, he preached in all the cities. 2 Corinthians 12, 2, Paul writing, I knew a man in Christ above 
14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knows, such an one harpazoed, caught up to the third heaven. And I saw a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knows, how he was harpazoed into paradise, caught up, and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Revelation 12, 5, And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up. That would be Jesus unto God and to his throne. Every place that word is used, it means to be caught up out of this atmosphere into another. And so there is a catching up, there is a rapture of the church at the beginning of the week that is called the tribulation week. We are not appointed to wrath. Romans 5, 9. Much more than now being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. 1 Thessalonians 1, 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. For God has not appointed us to wrath but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And I could read on Revelation 6.16, 6, Revelation 3.7, uh, but I'm not going to do it. But these things are now upon us. Um, I know by the Spirit of God, there's a storm coming. Hang on. It's going to be a great calm after it. Bless the Lord. And a great move of the Spirit. We're going to absolutely be a glorious church. And we're going to have progress from one degree of glory to the next until this atmosphere can no longer hold us. We are not going out of here beaten defeated in a rabbit hole. This earth's going to know we're here. But I do know there's some things on the horizon. Maybe this week. There's stirrings and things. We have some intelligence. But our best intelligence is inside the Word of God. Oh, precious Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Until then, you are to move from glory to glory. You are to be the glorious church without a spot or a wrinkle. You are to move in the power of God. Get over those stupid little things that would rob you of the glory. He just wants me and you to get gloriouser and gloriouser and gloriouser until earth cannot hold us and it has to let us go. These things are not far away. They're on the horizon and I love you. I love you with the love of the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise his holy name. Hallelujah.